Hello? All right, thank you. Um, before we begin, I would just like to remind you to please put your telephones on silent or turn them off, whatever is more convenient. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. It is my great honor as a representative of the International Relations and Law Club and the RITK community to host in our institution a renowned public figure in our political discourse. Mr. Albin Kurti, thank you for being here today. Um, today we chose to curate the topic, the collect collective action problem, a widespread phenomena in our society. As such, we wanted to invite a thought-provoking individual who is capable of change and who is capable of instilling this change in society. Given Mr. Kurti's impressive background in social mobilization and the pushing of political efforts, we thought of him as a well-equipped apprehender of the issue. I would like to remind you that there will be a Q&A session at the end of the speech, and without any further ado, please welcome to the podium Mr. Kurti. Dear students, uh, dear professors, um, dear Dean, Professor Louis Sell, yeah, Professor yeah. Mark Baskin, dear participants, I'm honored to participate today in this uh, uh, debate where Q&A will not be at the end, but uh, my presentation will be at the beginning. I believe that uh, toward truth we reach through dialogue, through mutual debate, where we together travel towards what we uh, consider later on as uh, just and right. I do not think that uh, etymology can exhaust uh, the meaning of notions and expressions and words, but it certainly may help and also it could take revenge on us if we don't pursue so. From its origin, the word collective means to gather, together, coming together, bringing together. We have to pay attention here that it doesn't mean to share something that we get. It means us getting together. <coughs> Therefore, in and within the collective, you already have the action of people, of individuals, who acted, moved, who gathered, and became a collective. In this sense, speaking of a collective action means speaking of a double action, coming together and acting together. An immediate question lurks behind the corner. Which is more important, action for the collective or collective action? <coughs> One answer is given by Portuguese sociologist Boaventura de Souza Santos, who says that uh, ideas that bring us together are even more important than ideas that lead us. So what unites us and brings us together is even more important than what leads us forward. On the other hand, etymology of the word action leads us to the meaning of the action as to put in motion, to do or make something, to act. The one who acts is separating her or himself from a certain state or situation, certain order of the things, the reality itself. This separation from the reality, this somewhat virtual virtuality of the action, perhaps made Zeno in ancient Greece two and a half millenniums ago, believed that there is no such thing as motion, that motion is illusory. And he has put efforts to prove this and made every else afterwards resolve what is known as Zeno's paradox today. Moving action from logic and maths to public and social life, I think that we could do best if treat action like Hannah Arendt in her book, Human Condition. Action as higher form in the trinity with labor and work. As a way of uh, individual expression and building block of human relations in public sphere. 
action as the core of vita activa. Collective action, if we now bring together these two words, collective and action, collective action stands in contrast to, on one hand, individual action, and on the other hand, to collective inaction. Let's deliberate briefly on both these accounts. Collective action is supposed to bring us together. We are not simply united first and only then after acting, but rather we get together precisely with our minds on the upcoming joint action. When we want to act, we are becoming together precisely in our minds with the aim, with the intent of having a collective action. Being in action is being for the future, being towards the future, being already in future. To the question why together, we should answer with a question. Why not together? Meaning that the burden of proof must be taken by those who want to move out with an individual action without getting together and preparing well and winning it all. In uh, several countries of Africa, they use a very nice uh, and wise saying, alone you can go faster, but together we go further. Alone we can go faster, but together we can go further. Collective action is about going further rather than faster giving priority to length reach out in comparison to the performed speed, giving priority to spatial strategy over temporal tactics. Likewise, collective action is set in contrast to collective inaction. Sitting together. An active versus passive body a movement in contradiction to passive other or past passive self. Distinction of number, statistical data, a finite set of elements in comparison to an event, to a movement, to a process. <coughs> collective action versus collective inaction. Similar to contradiction between being and doing between actuality and potentiality. Uh, Gilles Deleuze, a famous French philosopher that I don't agree with, but I like him a lot. <laughs> you know, there are things in life that you don't agree, but you like them. Said, uh, the smallest becomes equivalent to the largest once it is not separated from what it can do. Here is one of the points that I think is both uh, right and uh, useful. Again, the smallest becomes equivalent to the largest once it is not separated from what it can do. In this sense, we can say that uh, there are no small and big nations without first removing what small nations could do you have to eliminate the potentiality of a small people or nation in order to say that small nations are small and much smaller than big ones. I uh, lead, chair, participate in a political movement for almost uh, 14 years now in the form that it has and for over two decades in politics in general. And uh, throughout these years, I have been man of action. But uh, in action, something else than action is important. And that is ethics of action. So if I would deliberate a bit what were the ethics of our actions, which definitely were collective actions. So
so to speak of their uh, character rather than their form. They were certainly collective actions, but what were the ethics of these collective actions? Were they uh, utilitarian one of John Stuart Mill or deontological one of Immanuel Kant? Therefore, was it maximum of happiness for maximum number of people? Or uh, human reason as source of morality? I believe each of these for sure, but at different times in similar occasions when we've been eclectic and syncretic, especially in our justifications. But again, both of these are not only something underneath and higher at the same time. We, with the passage of time throughout all these years in our collective actions, with mounting experience and visibility to the public, the background of our actions, the prior reasoning of our actions, came from another kind of ethics. I believe neither Millian nor Kantian. Perhaps sometimes both, but not only. Again, higher and underneath these two. Namely, Aristotle ethics. Ethics of virtue where what we did was an outcome of who we became. Our character with certain virtues responded to situations and changed them. After many collective actions, we got established in political scene and among our society. And uh, from we are what we do, we went to we're doing what we are. If initially we were what we were doing, later on, after we got established, we were doing what we were. And uh, consequently, certain expectations of the public rose. Because uh, we have been established as a form and as character, and people were expecting from us uh, certain actions, certain collective actions. With our political movement, I believe we changed the politics, not only the political situation. In the sense that uh, thanks to the movement, who as its core has collective action, we advanced politics from uh, mediation and representation towards vision and action. So politics was not only about representing and mediating, but was about having a profound vision and doing something about it. And uh, in these our actions, we were not drowned. We maintained our political consciousness above the serious of our actions. Therefore, we were taking care of both consequence of actions and actions as sequence, as sequence within a strategy for our goals. Here, uh, we relied on the model of a psychologist, Leonard Parknas, for the phases towards an action. Alarm. <coughs> is an alarming information. And uh, he says something very interesting, that for terrible things, people are usually much more informed than we think. For terrible things, people are usually much more informed than we do things. And uh, bombarding with facts can cause passivity can cause collective inaction. So it is uh, very important that while organizing people for collective action, while mobilizing them, it's important uh, to have a communication which is not dominated merely by facts, 
but also by common experiences and emotions. And uh, creation of a certain we feeling. But uh, you do not create we feeling by talking about we feeling. One should create we feeling precisely by not talking about we feeling, but by adding emotions and experiences to facts, which should never be like shells with which you bombard the others. So uh, we should uh, feel interconnected by doing something which interconnects us rather than talking about the value of interconnectedness. Meanwhile, always distinguishing people from ideas, respecting the people, but questioning ideas. Or uh, how Gandhi put it, we should be soft with people and rigorous with principles. In our political movement, which expanded through years, we uh, try to do both almost all of the time. Action and work. As you probably know, work without action is a bit boring. Action without work is laziness. When you just want action, you don't want work. So it's a real challenge, but I don't think that there is an alternative to it. We must have both, work and action. And uh, we have had a lot of resistance towards our movement throughout these years, even though we were the resistant movement. And I think uh, this is something that you've all noticed probably. Our resistance was growing, a resistance against us was uh, withering away during the years. There are many reasons why there was resistance towards our resistance movement, which practiced and had as its principle collective action. And I think that uh, that has to do precisely with the action. Because uh, to agree with a certain action is of a higher order of responsibility than to agree with a certain stance or thought. Because when you agree with certain action, immediately the question of empathy beyond sympathy, of solidarity beyond uh, an agreeing click in social media occurs. You cannot agree with a certain action without certain readiness to participate yourself, to help yourself, to show solidarity. Not only empathy of the spectator, sorry, not only sympathy of the spectator, but also empathy of a comrade, of a friend, of an activist. So uh, some of the resistance against our movement was precisely because we were an action movement. Agreeing with us was already too much. So once you agree with uh, our political movement, Vedvendosie, you already surrender a lot from yourself. This is how it was perceived. Of course, we made our mistakes, and uh, perhaps we have thought, we should have thought more about this in uh, past years. However, what action did for emancipation of our society is that it made this shift from, let's say, inclusion to participation. You have noticed how many politicians different public figures, analysts in the media, journalists, professors. They speak about inclusion, including youth, including women. 
we as a political movement of collective action, we were a bit skeptic towards this expression of inclusion. Because when you include others, you include them from below in a certain hierarchy. It's a bit like European integration. You get included in European integration. You go at the bottom of a pyramid. You cannot go where Slovenia or Czech Republic are, let alone where France and Germany are, but perhaps at best where Bulgaria and Croatia are. So that means inclusion more than participation. And we as resistance movement, we wanted to emphasize participation. And the difference between inclusion and participation is around action. Once you act, once you perform an action, you are demanding a part. You participate. You want to take something. While being included means waiting in line, queuing for the approval of the higher other. So uh, the difference between inclusion and participation is around action and has to do with the inequality, with problematizing inequality. Inclusion, I think, does not problematize inequality. Participation problematizes inequality. It doesn't resolve it yet, but nonetheless problematizes. And here, I think, is a very important uh, dimension of uh, collective action in a political movement as ours. All our collective actions could be divided in two groups. Collective actions to achieve something that we consider to be good, of public interest, of general will, to achieve something positively, progressively, and uh, collective action to prevent a certain harm. All our actions were of these two types. For example, we wanted to find out the truth of missing persons or to have much faster the return of the bodies of missing persons to Kosovo in 2004 and 5 and 6 and later on. Or we wanted, with our collective action, to prevent a certain harm that was like a specter over our country. For example, this association of Serb majority municipalities or land swap or other projects which would harm our territory and statehood. So all our actions, I believe, could fall in uh, these uh, two groups. I uh, believe uh, that uh, collective action is not a choice. I believe that humans are public and social beings whose uh, state of being, normal state of being, is the one of both competition and cooperation, where the other is in front of us, behind us, around us, on the left, on the right, and inside us. So we are colonized by the other. Our body and our mind and our soul cannot avoid the other. And in this sense, uh, uh, I think that collective action is not something that we can choose. It's something that chooses us. So collective action is not something that we do. It's something that precedes us comes before us. So to citizens in a republic, it is collective action which gives birth, not the other way around. Therefore, John Stuart Mill would have said that collective action is at our interest. Immanuel Kant would have said that collective action is our dutiful imperative, whereas Aristotle would have said that collective action is in our nature. Thank you.
Mr. Putin. Uh, now, if someone has any question, um, I'd like to give the floor to you. But I'd ask you to introduce yourself first. So, are there any questions? Hello, thank you for coming. My name is Kate. I'm a junior here at AUK. It's working. Yes. Um, I have a question, which is, uh, when I see, for example, graffiti, um, um, well, I do agree that rights in history, in the uh, history of the world, rights have been fight, uh, fought for. Um, when you say not to negotiate, there are certain uh, certain times where negotiations are um, necessary in order to move forward. Um, what do you think when, uh, for example, people who uh, believe in your movement say no to negotiations? Hmm. Yeah. Well, of course, we negotiate all the time. I negotiated about coming here, which day, what hour. Uh, so, of course, we do negotiate. Uh, uh, this slogan comes from the year 2005, which seems like a very distant year now, like a history movie. Uh, in 2005, uh, talks, negotiations about status of Kosovo were being prepared. At that time, Kosovo did not declare independence and we were ruled by UNMIC, United Nations Mission in Kosovo. And uh, we were very much worried because UNMIC was about to launch negotiations between Kosovar government and Serbian government about Kosovo. And the political context of this project uh, alarmed us. We started this political movement with a double different problematization. So we didn't start as a political movement with solution. We started with a critique. We said, it is not true, as Unmik was saying, that Kosovo is a problem. We always consider that Serbia is a problem. Because this idea of negotiations between Kosovo and Serbia was put as if Kosovo is a problem in whose solution you should make Serbia a partner. And we said, because some, when somebody gives wrong answers, I really don't mind at all. Because that's another opinion, a different conviction. But when somebody who is very powerful poses the wrong question, then we have to be alarmed. So it Unmik posed, we believe, a wrong question. What is status of Kosovo? Status of Kosovo is undecided. And in negotiations with Serbia, we shall set it. We said, no, 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 wait a minute. It is not Kosovo which lacks status. But people of Kosovo lack freedom. It's a different question. So different problematization. And the political name of a normative name of this people's freedom is self-determination. This is how we start. And we read history, Woodrow Wilson, 14 points program, to Hurst Hannum and Antonio Cassese, for example, scholars. So uh, this is how we started. So this no negotiation does not mean as a universal abstract imperative for all of the times in all of the places. No. It meant in this specific political context, year 2005, in relation to negotiation with Serbia. So, no negotiations, your negotiata means no negotiations with Serbia about ourselves while not being free. Th this was, uh, because now I agree, if you see now the slogan, you might exactly think as you were posing the question. Thank Sorry. You. May I ask you one more question? Yeah, of course. Um, well, um, uh, about action. Um, nowadays, all over the world, because of the internet, there are conflicting ideologies as to what 
a population might perceive as a threat or not a threat, whether it is uh, built by bureaucrats for the people to um, move attention away from what's happening within the government. Um, there are many conflicting ideologies. And so, in order to take action, you said there, there has to be a we, it's instinctual, it's nature. Um, Jacques Derrida calls this war within friendship. Uh, no, friendship within war, rather, or natural disasters. Like in the case of 9-11 or Hurricane Katrina, when Americans felt more patriotic because of the disaster. They became more friends. But when there are conflicting ideologies and some are made to seem like they're more of a threat than they actually are, yeah. um, how is it that we can come together and actually fight injustice that we are facing, whether or not we know it? Uh, this is very difficult. <laughs> yes, I, I don't see other way except uh, virtue ethics, good people coming together. So uh, if uh, love uh, amounts to care, if Honesty amounts to truth, and uh, if uh, friendship amounts to favor, I think that uh, good people with these three types of virtues should do everything to find each other for a collective action. Get organized, don't agonize, as the saying goes. So I, I just think that uh, this double action of getting together and acting together is the only way forward. There is huge unpredictability because, as you have said, on one hand, we have a certain threat, a certain danger, which some people believe it can be calculated. But on the other hand, once you do an action, there is a certain unpredictability. But what to do? You know? Human beings are more than enigmatic. They are mysterious. So I think that uh, in a certain political context, certain era, also globally, we should try to organize as best as we can. Because as Vonnegut said, Every triumph is a triumph of an organization, which means that in every victory, you will find an organization. It's not possible to locate and distinguish a certain victory without finding there an organization. So I don't think that we should uh, totalize the value of uh, organization but one has to have it when people get together and do a collective action. So uh, one of the slogans we used internally in our movement is no organization without action and no action without organization. So it's not OK if you just do an action out of desperation or frustration and which uh, helps you like vomit after hangover, you know. No, no action like that. You, know, you need to prepare organization and do action, sequence, consequence, and so on. But on the other hand, also no organization without action. Not to become like self-sufficient, self-perpetuating bureaucracy. You need action, you need progress. And uh, here I think that because we live at times when trust is the victim, it's difficult to trust nowadays. It's very important virtue ethics people to, to get together for collective action. I'll sorry, just take uh, one more minute of your time. <coughs> uh, you've uh, read and listened and saw a lot of this issue of fake news because a lot of threat that you've mentioned comes out to be nothing, really, hot air. So what is this problem with fake news? My impression is that uh, the problem with fake news is not that it's fake, it's not news. 
There is nothing new in fake news. We all knew it before. Uh, Walter Benjamin uh, said in one of his books, uh, people have no interest in uh, private opinion, in, uh, in opinions. They are private. People have a lot of interest in judgments. So I think that neo-fascists in Europe which uh, are being financed a lot by Putin and Russia, from Finland to Greece to Netherlands and France, and Germany for that matter, uh, as if they've read Walter Benjamin. Or Walter Benjamin is so universal. They knew that people have interest in judgments, not in opinions, because opinions are a private matter. So they decided their judgments to shape as news, and we call them fake news. So again, perhaps in academia, and not only among social and political activists, it is very necessary to problematize from another angle, Benjaminian angle, the issue of fake news, that uh, these are not news at all, rather than being fake. Are there any other questions? Okay. Hi, Mr. I am Inda Brada, a junior student at RIT Kosovo. Uh, and I wanted to ask you a question, like, lately we have seen the rises of protests in Belgrade, in Podgorica, in Albania, but we haven't seen the rises of progress in Kosovo, even though that Kosovers are always contemplating about the political issues in Kosovo and about the quality of life in here. So do you know why is there a lack of collective action in Kosovo nowadays, even though that previously there have been lots of collective action going from demonstrators in 81 and up to nowadays? Mm -hmm. So why is this not happening in Kosovo and it is happening in the region? And there is no positive action in here. Mm. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, your question is uh, rightly so in time and in place. <laughs> uh, because if Serbia has experience in wars, we Albanians have in demonstrations and protests throughout the 20th century. And I believe that in the Balkans, uh, there can be <coughs> no war without Serbia and no peace without Albanians. Uh, because wherever you have a war in the Balkans, you find Serbia there. There is no chance to have a war in the Balkans without getting to Serbia there. Well, Albanians don't really are much into wars, but uh, without them, you cannot get peace. And uh, I think that, yes, protests and demonstrations are needed in Kosovo. There are many reasons, perhaps, why they are happening in Belgrade, in uh, uh, Montenegro, a bit in Bosnia and Herzegovina as well, in Albania. Maybe because we already did them late, uh, earlier on, and they are doing later against authoritarian leaders and so on. But I think that uh, an additional reason is that uh, this project of ec territorial exchange, land swap, I think failed. And last year, we had one demonstration, but the biggest one since the end of the war. And uh, this project of land swap failed. The idea did not die. And we are in this interface. And now, from this big political and geopolitical issue to shift to social issues, which are even more real, as if is needed a bit of effort and time. But I think we're going there. And thank you for encouraging me. Can you collect two questions at a time? Just a short one. 
Hi, uh, my name is Andrew, and I would want to ask you, you as a leader of collective movement, do you think it is your right to take responsibility <laughs> for the collective and choose what you think is right for them, even if the collective does not think so? So would you be ready to, to prove that your judgment is better than the people's if you think that is the right thing to do? One more question, and then we can address them. Hello, thank you for coming here. First of all, I'm Basar Berghi, a senior student here. So my question would be this. Uh, one of the most widely used critiques against your movement is that you're too idealistic, that you need to get your feet on the ground, and critiques like that. You already mentioned trying to balance between uh, utilitarianism, saying you know, we have to look out, out after our interests, and looking after our principles. So my question would be, when there is a problem in front of the in, fr in front of your movement, where the immediate interest conflicts the principles, which one would you choose, and why? Hmm. I wish I knew. So, <laughs> because you know, it's not really fair. Because he posed this question as if it's a very easy one. Now you answer, we continue. Uh, we cannot do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, what is uh, very much important is to have internal democracy. <coughs> People to discuss. We should not get tired of posing arguments, using reason, and having endless number of meetings in order to really be informed, to have a mature debate, and to exhaust all the stance points. So in the end, we will have to decide by voting. I don't think that there is any other way. I know there are people who don't like to have to persuade the others, but that's what democracy is about. You get a floor and you try to raise a certain issue or contradict another. But what I think we lack nowadays is that perhaps there should be more studies and not only discussions. On certain issues, is also important to study it. Not only to get around the table, discuss it, vote, and decide. So in this sense, university is very important. In this sense, scientific approach is very important. Because for certain things, uh, you need to have a proper study prior to discussion and to decision making. So studying and discussion is uh, very important. Because if you just discuss endlessly without competence on certain issue, you can make a collective mistake. It's important to have study and discussion, both. This is what we try. My name is Avisa Yashare, and I'm a fourth year student here. Um, my question is, so outcome is basically an, an inherent demand to collective action. You gather for a specific cause, you want a specific outcome out of it. My question is, what do we do when the outcome is not observable? It's taking too long, that's a continuous, tremendous effort. If you don't see uh, the outcome, how do you not get discouraged, and how do you mobilize your people then? What is the next step? Uh, a few years back uh, in Kosovo as a guest lecturer in Pristina uh, was a famous uh, philosopher, I think she lives in New York now, Gayatri Spivak, she translated Derrida of grammatology. Uh, and uh, she asked all of us something, like two questions who were there around her and uh, asked me, you know, why do you keep on going? What is important for you, like in life? 
And uh, of course, these are difficult questions, but it is more important to, what are your initial thoughts on it? Like, it's, it's not the point to write an answer tomorrow. It's important to say something there spontaneously. And first two things that came to my mind were struggle and friends. Uh, so basically, struggle and friends is what keeps me going. So if I would remain without friends and out of a struggle, then I would not be able to keep on going. But I think that first, initially, uh, it is the people who enable struggle. But later on, it is the struggle which enables people. So you reverse the roles. The struggle in which you are uh, makes you go on. And uh, you never surrender, never yield, never give up, <coughs> keep on going despite the uh, outcomes. So some conviction that you are right, I believe, is not enough. That's why I did not mention it. It's not enough to keep on going to think that, okay, the right is on my side, the truth is in my head, and the justice is in, is in my heart. This could be necessary, but it's not sufficient. So what makes it sufficient is struggle with, with, with friends. Even though certain outcomes uh, are there in the future, perhaps withdrawing in the future. Uh, in addition to this, uh, I uh, should mention that uh, many of our actions were there to prevent a certain harm. So it's important to document the inexisting harm. So what you managed to prevent is important in the organization to be documented. Somebody should register, should archive all the bad things that did not happen because you acted. And uh, even though the harm is not observable, it can be documented. Empirically, I think it's doable to show certain harms that did not happen because you acted. And in this way, this also gives additional strength. You know, and about, sorry, about being too idealistic. I think that with idealism and fear, you always overdo them. You know, whenever you're afraid, you're afraid a bit more than you should. You know, you, over, you overdo fear and you overdo idealism. But it's up to process, to collective actions, to political movements to soften it or to appropriate it down the way. It, it, it's not that you can do it. I don't think that somebody, if somebody seems too idealistic, can cure himself or herself. No, it's up to others and to the process. And uh, for me, all those who overdo with idealism are of a less problem than those who overdo it with fear. Whenever you fear, you fear too much. So don't forget this. Whenever you're afraid, you're a bit afraid too much. It's not that real. So. Yes? May I? Uh, my name is Arian Smakai. I'm a junior student. And you mentioned uh, a problem that is becoming increasingly present uh, in the past or right now, which is uh, the spreading of fake news. And I think it's a side effect of, of platforms like Facebook, YouTube, and such, which allow people to, to share their opinions unfiltered to, to a huge problem. Um, even though it's an international problem, I think, uh, what would you do to stop it or decrease it domestically here in Kosovo? Uh, there is an Italian scholar, I forgot her name. She wrote a very interesting essay. Uh, she says that uh, there can be no such thing as age of information. Age of information will very soon turn into age of reputation. 
So, you know, like oh, things die out of excess, not out of lack. Even art can die out of excess. You know? So when when you do too much, things die. Not when you don't have enough. And in this sense, uh, age of information with too much information, the information was the victim. And very soon we entered age of reputation. Who is saying what? So now, whenever we read certain news, prior to reading the news, we check in which media it is presented. So this is age of reputation. And uh, what uh, can be done is that uh, I, a bit of old school in this sense, I think not only Facebook, but face to face. We need to meet a lot. I think it's not uh, meeting among people is not replaceable, cannot be substituted. Uh, one essay I read as a critique of Facebook, don't misunderstand me, I use it all the time, but uh, one critique is that uh, there are two negative consequences of Facebook and social media uh, generally. One is shallow friendships. You know, your friend is one click, right? When I was in high school, calling somebody a friend was of a, such a substance. Uh, nowadays, friends is quite easy to become. So shallow friendships is one something that we should be aware. And second is obsession with self-image. So uh, we are too much in the mirror somehow. We're too much uh, uh, watching, gazing ourselves in the mirror instead of opening the window and seeing what is outside. So this obsession with self-image, these are two negative social consequences that one should uh, be aware with. Uh, the other hand, I don't think that uh, it is possible to uh, merely by law regulate this issue. So I'm not, I'm against Chinese model. So where you <coughs> simply restrict social media. I don't think that that's the right way forward. Only with social organization, with rising awareness, with critical thinking, one can ameliorate all these negative effects. And uh, this means uh, more critique and uh, not taking things at face value, be they on Facebook or elsewhere. So the yes. And uh, minds who think alike, other friends of yours, should act collectively. Uh, well, I must say that uh, students have uh, quite an open path in public, institutional, social life in Kosovo for their careers because the political elite in Kosovo has never been so much discredited as now. So even though it looks for you quite difficult to do changes, I think it was never easier. Because uh, you have so many authoritative people without authority. We have so many famous people without credibility. We have so many important personalities without competence. So, path is open. Thank you.